Hey, this is David Hayter. You may know me as the screenwriter of films like X-Men, X-Men 2, and Watchmen, but you probably know me best as the voice of Solid Snake from Metal Gear Solid. And you're listening to Hawaii's number one podcast, the Casanova Podcast. Kept you waiting, huh? Just any intruders. The soon to be famous. Battle Toads? <gasps> it's the Queen! Wait! We can team up! Now that you're here, we can execute my plan to defeat the Topians together. Sup, Topian scum? We just stole the spaceship and we're coming for you. Did that voice just say it was going to destroy us? Who would want to destroy you? You've got the most amazing shape. And now I am one. We're not heroes, Rash. We're puppets. I am not a puppet. Buy our video games. Yeah, that's just like one of a thousand phrases. <laughs> Things are about to get very, very dark. Oh yeah, yum yum time. I'm so fun. We're gonna be famous. All right, and welcome everyone to another episode of Hawaii's number one podcast, the Casanova Podcast. I'm your host, Mikhail Casanova, and today I've got the true honor and privilege of having the one, the only AJ of Delala Studios. Man, it is such an honor to have you on the show. How's it going, AJ? <laughs> yeah, it's great. Thank you very much for having me. Like, really been looking forward to this. So it's great to be here. Definitely, definitely. And, you know, for for the audience uh, who may not know, and I don't know how you don't know, but uh, Delala Studios is a company that worked on and created the recent Battletoads, which is a phenomenal game, which if you haven't played it, go out and play it. Especially if you are like me, you grew up playing Battletoads from the 80s and 90s. It's really a love letter to the franchise but man how, how was that like getting the opportunity to work on such a legendary ip like that had to have been surreal oh massively i mean you know it's as cliche as it sounds it was literally a dream come true um <laughs> you know battle toads has been one of my favorite games since i first played you know battle toads double dragon um and mm -hmm. then 1991 um and kind of one of my bucket list goals for kind of since I've had a studio is to one day get to make a Battletoad sequel. Um, but it was definitely one of those bucket list goals that I didn't really ever see as obtainable. Like it mm. never really felt like something that would be within grasp. So kind of the last two years of my life have literally been working on a dream game. Um, so yeah, it's been absolutely incredible. Nice. Nice. And, and, and speaking of like uh, the law studios, like how did you guys come to be formed and, and, like, what was the history on that? Yeah, so um, we're very cliche. We, we originally were two guys in a garage with no money. Um, mm -hmm. So kind of my background was um, I was a designer and programmer at Jagex, the guys mm -hmm. who make RuneScape. So I was working on a game there called Stella Dawn. Um, whilst I was working there, this guy joined called Craig. Um, I got put as his work mentor, which is the worst idea in history. Um, mm -hmm. Me mentoring anyone was, uh, I don't know what they were thinking. Um, <laughs> and kind of, we got on really well. We gelled really well. We did some great stuff together at Jagex. Um, I then left there to join Bossa. Um, about six months later, Craig gave me a call. He wasn't happy at Jagex anymore. Um, so I got him introduced to Bossa and he came with me there. 
And then kind of, we worked on Boss's first game, did really well, picked up a BAFTA, and it kind of felt like the way things had been going for us, kind of career-wise and personally, like we felt like it was a good time to kind of go do something else. Mm -hmm. um, and kind of the way we saw it was like, we're at a point in our lives where, you know, I had four, four years industry experience. Mm -hmm. We didn't have mortgages. We didn't have kids at the time. Like, so we're like, look, look, this should take a gamble. Um, so we kind of, we quit our well-paid London jobs. Uh, I moved into my mum's garage. He moved into his girlfriend's mum's spare bedroom. Um, and we had the equivalent of about $4,000 between us. Um, and yeah. We kind of that was it there was no plan there was no game idea we just started a studio um and then kind of over the last eight years we've gone from two guys in a garage to now there's you know there's 23 of us in our own mm -hmm. office premises in the town i grew up in um ironically the i've opened the studio literally a five minute walk from the garage i started the studio in um wow but like yeah it's kind of it you know when we were two people, we were always like, oh, we'll never get bigger than five. And then we were 10 and we we're like, we'll never get bigger than 12. And like, yeah, now it's 23 of us and it's all very, very surreal. Wow. Oh, that's that. I mean, and that, the funny thing is, like, when you think about it, like a lot of people who are incredibly successful, such as yourself, like you take chances, like you really sometimes you just have to you take a gamble on yourself because you never know if it's going to pay out or not. And you know, for you guys, it definitely did. Like, I, I, I applaud you guys. Like that, that's a risk, and it's one I would take myself. It's one <laughs> I've actually done something like that myself recently. Um, about a year ago, I actually quit my job. Uh, I had a job in IT. I was being paid very well, and I just, you know, one thing to led to another. I'm like, you know what? I feel like I have this opportunity to work alongside the game industry. It feels like it's a once in a lifetime opportunity. I'm going to take a chance on myself. My wife's like, okay, if it don't work out, you better get a job. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, but that's it. Like, you know, the thing I always say to everyone is like, you shouldn't go through life being a selfish person. But the one thing you do need to be self-focused on is your job. Like, yeah, you work for 80% of your life, 80% of a week, for 80% of a month, for 80% of a year. Like, mm -hmm. If you're miserable, you're basically committing yourself to be miserable for 80% of your life. And that is insane, right? Yeah. So, you know, the, the way I always say it is like you've got to, you've got to focus on yourself with your career as long as you're not doing damage to someone else. Like, yeah. you know, and in your case, you know, you spoke to your wife first. My case, you know, I spoke to my girlfriend and my parents and let them know. Like, but yeah, you know, it's that I, I don't know if you remember the magic school bus, the car. Yeah, thing. yeah, I remember it. <laughs> but the, the teacher in that Miss Frizzle, like, her phrase is a phrase I use in our, like, even our official documentation here with the take chances, make mistakes, get messy. And, like, <laughs> we've lived by that from day one and kind of, you know, we encourage mistakes, you know. The whole fail fast thing is very cliche, but, like, it's important for me here that no one is ever scared of making a mistake and admitting mm -hmm. they've made a mistake because we only exist because I've made so many mistakes in my entire career. Do you know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. you know, most of the early policies at Dalala was where I'd fucked up in my past or where I'd seen managers do badly. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, like when you're in a position and you've got the right people around you to kind of take those gambles, it's, it's a hundred percent worth going for. Definitely. Definitely. And, and what about the, some of the, the staff there at Dalala Studios? Like what, what is like the cohesion with you guys? Like, is there like a, a super good tight synergy that's there or you know, like how, how would you describe it? Um, yeah, it's, it's weird. It's very weird. Like I've never, um, in my career, I've never worked where the team all gets on. There's no, there's, it's easy for me to say, cause I'm the boss, right? But there's no politics. <laughs> There's, there's no politics. I just don't deal. I don't spend any of my time, especially now dealing mm -hmm. with politics, dealing with like people arguing. There isn't any of that here. There's just, you know, everyone here is like, we want not only the games to be successful that we make, but everyone wants the studio to be successful. And um, mm -hmm. that just means I'm incredibly, you know, I'm spoiled. I'm very lucky. Um, mm -hmm. You know, Eric, my animation director, Eric's been in games for 26 years. Like, um, wow. He, his first job was cleaning up the line work on Earthworm Jim. Um, and so like, he's been doing this a long time and he said like, he's never worked at a studio where it is like, everyone just wants to work together. Everyone just mm -hmm. really connects. Um, and we're not perfect. And I'm not saying for a second we are. And 
we learned a lot of hard lessons on Battletoads. You know, mm -hmm. we started Battletoads when we signed it. There was 11 of us. Um, over the course of the last two years of making the game, we not only grew to 23, but with our contract partners that we worked with, the project was 67 people nearly at one point. Like, that's wow. a big old project. The biggest I'd ever managed before that was 19. Um, so, you know, we had a lot of things to learn, a lot of things we could know, we know moving forward. Um, but yeah, the team here, man, like, I mean, my tech director, Ben, so Delala was eight in June. Uh, my mm -hmm. tech director, Ben, has worked for me for eight years in December. Um, my senior programmer, Chris, had worked for me eight years in July. He joined two weeks after the studio formed and he's still here. Um, you know, in, in eight years, we've had seven people leave the studio. One of them mm -hmm. was my sister because she got pregnant and then my family moved, so I can forgive her. <laughs> <laughs> one of them was my co-founder who decided to leave games for teaching um wow like yeah like i just i just feel very lucky man like i just i've i've got these incredible people around me who are just the most talented people i've ever worked with and everyone is there's just no dicks no one's being a dick and yeah. you know even the four years i had before delala like i can't say i went a, a month without having to deal with office politics do you know what i mean yeah yeah and, and uh, you know, I hope for the audience, I hope you guys understand, like dealing with office politics. <laughs> <laughs> that's one of the reasons I left my old job. It's like, it, it's, it's so mind numbing. Cause it's like, what does that do to help the work environment? What does that do to encourage employer employees to want to work harder or, or to stay, you know, working with the company because office politics can just run people out. Oh, quickly. And it's, it's toxic, man. It's like a cancer. Yeah. Like it's, it just spreads. Like, you know, we've had a neg like we've had negative people. We've had a negative person. And like the day after they had gone, like, you know, and it didn't end on bad terms. It ended on the right terms. But the day after they were gone, there was a, a there, it'd been lifted, man. There was that, mm -hmm. that. And you don't realize how much of a palpable thing that negativity is and the impact it has on other people. And I'm not trying to sound like a life coach. Um, <laughs> no, it's fine. But, you know, one of my mentors, a guy, my, we call him Uncle Lou, like he told me very, very early on in my career, he said, look, you know, he'd been a creative director at THQ, he'd run his own studios twice, and he said, you end up spending 80% of your time with 10% of your staff when they're a problem, because that 10% who are causing issues, they just, they just absorb all the time in the world. And um, mm -hmm. you kind of, whenever you get advice, you brush it off a little bit, right? Oh, that's not going to happen to me. And then you know, it happened and you, you just sit there and you're like, shit, like, this is insane. Like, why am I getting up each day worried about this one person or worried about mm -hmm. the, what these two people have said? And, you know, when you're in an environment where you're not dealing with that and all that really matters is the game and the people around you like like each other, like, it's, mm -hmm. it's, it's priceless, man. Nice. nice. And, um, you know, with with, you know, with everything that you've gone through, clearly incredibly successful, you know, hats off to you with that. Um, with, when it came to like, I guess my, Microsoft and Rare Studios reaching out to you guys to work on Battletoads. I know that was surreal, <laughs> but like, did they have any idea of what they wanted going in? Or was this like, here's a blank canvas. You do what you want to do with it. Oh, man. Uh, so, I met Craig Duncan, who runs Rare, uh, about three months after I made the studio in 2012. Um, mm -hmm. We've been friends ever since. He's another mentor. Every time I spoke to him from that first time, I was like, can we have Battletoads? Can we have Battletoads? Can we have Battletoads? <laughs> and, you know, we weren't ready. When we were two guys in the garage, we weren't ready. When we were kind of, you know, six of us, we weren't ready. Um, and when eventually kind of we showed him some of the stuff we'd been doing, our tools kind of, we found our feet as kind of, you know, we wanted to be this 2D animation based studio. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it was then us, we pitched the concept. So Rare have been amazing partners. It's been great to be published by Xbox Game Studios. Um, but like this, what what you see here is kind of our concept, it's our design and our execution. They, they didn't tell us to do anything. Um, they were wow. incredible. They were just supportive. They really gave me carte blanche with the whole franchise. Like, and, I, and going in, I was very honest. Like I said to them, look, you know, I want to do the Cartoon Network influence. I don't want to. I don't want to make a Battletoads game just for Battletoads arcade fans. I want to, you know, I want people mm -hmm. to feel now what I felt in the '90s, and like that means taking some risks and, 
yeah, I mean, they've just been super supportive and, you know, we've worked with great people there. Paul Collins, who was like our creative liaison and Paul mm-hmm. Cunningham, who was like our, um, effectively our external producer, like they protected us like we were a Microsoft studio and they helped us navigate the landscape of, you know, making a first party game. Um, but yeah, like what you're seeing is not like Delala through a, a rare filter. You're literally really seeing unfiltered Delala when you play Battletoads. Yeah, and I had to say, like, I absolutely love what you guys have done with it, from the art style to the humor to the gameplay. It's got one of the deepest combat systems that I play in a brawler this year. I'd like the, the only there's only three brawlers that have come out this year that I felt were really deep, and it's Battle Toads, uh, the Takeover from Mac McMuscles, and um, uh, uh, Streets of Rage Four. Like those were the only three really deep brawlers that have come out this year, and like. The what I love about Battletoads is you have such a free flow combat system. Like you can start a combo with one enemy, pull another one towards you with the tongue lash, you know, knock him in the air, do a bunch of stuff there. And it's just like it's it it's so great. And what I've seen, and maybe you've seen this too, like there's criticisms where people say like the combat is it doesn't feel like Battletoads or you know, it doesn't look like Battletoads. I'm over here thinking. Did we grow up playing the same Battletoads or what? Like, it's, it's, it's funny, and I've seen a lot of the criticism probably come from people who are fans. Um, that's me taking shots, not not AJ. <laughs> this is me. But it's like, for me, Battletoads has always been humor-centric and gameplay-centric, and has always had a unique art style for the time period that it was in. So I understood it. Like when I was playing it, I streamed the game from start to finish on Twitch. And I'm like, yo, the humor is, this is hilarious. I love the humor. I love the fact that it pokes fun at itself and how long it's been. Like, because I'm like, wait, they've done that before. Like there's references to like Street Fighter too. Like with the the, the Dark Queen <laughs> in previous. So it's, it's funny. It's, it's, just, it's been funny for me seeing the reaction to it like you have a lot of people who actually the ones who pick it up and play it love it a lot of long time fans love it but it's like i think there's kind of like this i guess a generational gap with some people who just don't get it or claim that you know the ones that are like oh yeah i'm a fan but you're not really i don't know i'm rambling what, what are your thoughts on it <laughs> no like i think one of the one of the things that's wonderful about the franchise is i think that it means different things to different people like yeah when you talk to some people, well, their Battle Toads is Battle Toads Arcade from '94, right? And like yeah. they want the gritty, they want the heavy metal inspired aesthetic, they want the brutal combat, they want the you know the the dick punchy, and they want that side of things. Um, and then there are the people like me who like their gateway into Battle Toads was Battle Toads and Double Dragon. And then like yep. once I had emulators and ROMs, my favorite one was the 1991, the original, because I could get past the, the turbo bike level and enjoy the rest of the game. Um, and so, like, going into this, like, I knew that I didn't want to make a side-scrolling brawler. Like, I didn't want the game to just be that because mm-hmm. there's teams out there that do that better than us already. So, you know, Dot Emu showed that with Streets of Rage 4. Like, if if I'd been just making a pure brawler, when Streets of Rage 4 come out, I would have been sobbing. I would have just been like, oh, my God, I've just spent two years of my life and now someone has come out with this, like, incredible combat game. Um but that wasn't the game I wanted, you know, side scrolling combat was always going to be a part of it, but mm-hmm. you know, you know, you've played it, right? Like it's probably, it's probably less than a quarter. No, it's probably maybe a quarter, maybe just more of the game mm-hmm. is combat. Um, but that's what I wanted. I wanted a mashup. I wanted, you know, when we were in like pre pre-production and I don't know if I've even said this yet, we had a, we we were just prototyping on paper and like live action prototypes and, you know, and some of the stuff we can wear, like blind date boss battle, which was where you went on a dating show and then you answered questions and you picked your date and it was a boss and that was the boss. You like, we went. <laughs> some of the stuff that made it in isn't half as crazy as the stuff that didn't. Um, but those got those, you know, those people, those fans who like Battle Toads Arcade is their game. Their that's their Battle Toads. It would be very hard for them to go into what we've made and like, if that's what they're wanting, getting what we've put in front, you know going two levels in and suddenly you're given a massage like that's not what they want they that that's not the type of humor they wanted that's not the execution of their characters um 
and I have no bad feelings for those people. Like those people are just as important to us than, as the people who have loved it. Um, because mm-hmm. they, they were the vocal fans who were part of the people that wanted a new Battletoads. Um, but yeah, like I definitely, we never set out to insult any fans, but we also didn't necessarily set out to make a Battletoads that was just for Battletoads fans. Um, yeah. Because it's been 26 years, man. Like, who knows how many Battletoads fans are still alive or, you know, still playing games like it's, you yeah. know. So what I wanted was like, it's like you said, Battletoads for me was cartoons. It was over the top Tex Avery poses. It was, oh my God, I was in the beat up. Now I'm vertically descending. Now I'm on a, bu- now I'm in a platform level. Like <laughs> that's that to me, Battletoads. Um, and so that was the influence I brought in. I wanted to be like, okay, well, I'm looking now as someone who's, grown up with Battletoads and Earthworm Jim and Cartoon Network, like mm-hmm. what a modern Battletoads look like to me. Um, so that's kind of what you're seeing. You're not seeing a Battletoads game for Battletoads fans. You're seeing a Battletoads game by Battletoads fans. And I think it's a different thing. Yeah. No, I I absolutely loved it, man. Like, honestly, you know, when I was streaming it, I had a couple of people asking, like, why is there a shmup level in here? And I'm like, have you never played Battletoads? <laughs> <laughs> That's not new. <laughs> like, yeah. but, but Battletoads has never been a franchise that's just purely a brawler. Like, it's always had variety in it. And I feel like, honestly, you know, and this is not me trying to stroke your ego, but I'm stroking your ego. <laughs> um, the way you guys implemented everything, there's challenge the the speed by the you know the turbo tunnel level and with the the levels with the dark queen where you're running or is timed and platformer <laughs> specific everything in the game even down to the bosses is challenging but fair it's not old school like i think a lot of people if they really wanted old school battle toads it would deter a lot of people because it is freaking hard. Brutal, like man. just <laughs> absolutely brutal. Yeah, no, exactly. And like, you know, I was speaking to some people yesterday and kind of, they asked me kind of, you know, how, did I, why did we know it was as hard as it was? Cause we didn't like, you know, I think what we made, you know, let's be honest, 1991 battle toad, you get to turbo tunnel. That's a 10 out of 10 on difficulty like that. Yeah. You know, we when we released this game, we thought Toad, like our normal, we thought maybe we were a five or a six. And then mm-hmm. everyone played it. And I actually think, looking now, maybe we're more of an eight, like an eight out of ten on difficulty because mm-hmm. we just got so close to it, man. Like, we're so close to it that I don't think we could see how hard some of it was because I, as, as the blindfolded players know, right, you can memorize levels like the turbo bike levels. And um. So for us, we played them hundreds, maybe thousands of times. And mm-hmm. suddenly I think my relativity as a new player compared to someone that worked and it went. Um, but yeah, we're definitely, if we'd gone as hard as a 90, not, what, you know, I love Battletoads 91, but I love Battletoads 91 because emulators let me save my state and then rare replay <laughs> let me rewind because my favorite level is the level after the turbo bike. And I didn't mm-hmm. do that for 15 years. Like... <laughs> <laughs> So, yeah, like, I think if we'd made that, like, I can't think of anything worse for me than if, you know, no one ever got past our third level. Like, that would be so upsetting for me. Yeah. And I saw, like, in a lot of people's reviews when they were doing the Turbo Tunnel level, like, a lot of people were saying, like, it was just incredibly difficult to get through that. And I'm watching gameplay. Like, I guess for me, also being a, a video game reviewer, I'm very thorough in going through the controls and see what does and doesn't work because I think that's very important when you're providing a review that people understand, okay, this is what, you, you know, in this section you could probably do this or that. Like, not giving away, like, this is how you're going to complete it, but letting people know this is the functions that I notice in the turbo tone levels. Like, for me, I'm like, if I'm tapping the shoulder buttons, I can dash in that direction, like left or right. And I was watching a lot of reviewers as they were reviewing the game and they're doing the turbo tunnel. And I'm like, why are you not dashing? <laughs> you know, I'm like, you d- like, I mean, you can't beat the levels if you just like move left to right. You just have to memorize, okay, at this second, go here, go here, go here. But you're making it infinitely harder on yourself if you're doing it like that. And I, I just didn't like, 
I don't know. Like, I, I see that maybe it's just the journalistic side of me. Like, I see it so much with reviewers these days. And I'm like, why are you not doing this? Like, uh, what was the game that came out uh, uh, recently? No Straight Roads. Like, I was, I love that game. I love the aesthetics of it. And when I'm watching reviewers, I'm like, why are you just eating damage? Why are you not touching? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, man. I think that's the 90s gamer in me. <laughs> it, and it's interesting, right, man? Like It's like what you said about Turbo Tunnel. I think that part of that, when I see that, is kind of like, oh, like did maybe the tutorials weren't obvious enough. Maybe mm. like you're so, for new players, maybe you're concentrating so hard that you don't notice this thing slide in. Um, but yeah, like, although that level is completable without using the shoulder buttons, but you have mm. to be good, like, you know, I don't, I've not played the game. I don't think I've played the game in about a month. Like I played it just as it released, basically. Mm -hmm. And because obviously I've been playing it every day, all the way start to finish multiple times. Um, yeah. And I, I think now if I tried, I wouldn't be able to do Turbo Tunnel without boosting. I think it would take me a little while to get back. <laughs> like it's, it's a hard level, man. It's a hard yeah. level. Yeah. Uh, but definitely, like with, with the the visual aesthetics uh, for Battletoads, it really reminded me of similar to what um, Majesco did with Double Dragon back in 2012. With you know Double Dragon, um, God, what's the last name? It's Double Dragon. Uh, Neon, the last one. Neon, yeah. Like it reminded me of that, and it's you know similar humor, uh, art style. It's got that 80s, early 90s cartoon aesthetic, and like you guys went in a similar route, which I love that you did it in a 2D animated style because there's so much character and expression and life in the characters. Um, it just, it, it was just so well done, like how you guys did it. And like I, I, and it's like at any moment, it looks like you're playing a cartoon. Like it doesn't, most games, you'll, it'll, it'll look like you're playing a video game. You'll have a 3D character. But in your, this sense, like, it added, you know, the toads animate so well. There were points where, like, when I was playing it, you know, my wife or a family member would come by and they're like, oh, what cartoon is this? <laughs> like, it that's how great it looked. So um, how did you guys, when it came to, like, figuring out that's the art style you guys wanted to go with? Like, I, I know we talked earlier about, you know, most Battletoads fans wanted the Battletoads arcade heavy metal look, but... Like, how did you come to that? Like, and, and and doing the art process, like, was that very difficult? Did that take a lot of time for you guys? So it's a great question, man. Like, I think um, to answer it in the reverse order, like making the, the art of the game was very, mm. very time consuming. Um, but like finding the style wasn't that time consuming and, and relatively. Um, I kind of had an idea going in what I wanted, right? Like I knew that I wanted that cartoon network, that earthworm gym kind of that, that, that style of influence to be shown through. Um, mm -hmm. And like I said, that's in our blood a little bit. So like every car animation director, he was a cleanup artist on earthworm gym one, earthworm gym two. Um, and his kind of his mentor and one of our friends, um, Mike Dietz and Ed Schofield. So mm -hmm. Mike was the animation director on like Aladdin, Jungle Book, earthworm gym, cool spot. Um, and Mike and Ed basically helped us do the toad designs back when we first started pitching in like 2016. Um, mm -hmm. So we blasted out hundreds, like 200 to 300 toad designs. And we started narrowing down like what were the bits we liked, what kind of worked for us. Um, and we knew we wanted this, you know, over the top, you know, very Tex Avery, Warner Brothers stretch and squish approach to animation. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, one of the one of the pillars for the project was always playable cartoon. Like I said, like at any point, it has to feel like you're playing a cartoon. Um, mm -hmm. And so we always work to that. And then kind of when we really found our toads and we knew these were the toads and, you know, we landed on our final designs. And then like most art files, we ended up on our underscore final final designs um, where <laughs> We had our toads and then we animated them. We we're like, actually, do you know what? Like to hit what we want to do, let's let's slightly simplify the designs. Let's go slightly more graphic. Um, you'll see a lot in our character designs that we play like straight edges off against curves. So you'll see mm -hmm. a lot on the toad's arms, like they'll have a very straight part of their forearm and then you'll see a very curved part. Um, and when we landed on that kind of, that was it. We knew this is how we we're going to animate the game. This is what our characters would look like. 
and mm -hmm. then environments you know we when we worked on that it was figuring out what is a complementary style that fits the cartoon but isn't necessarily just the character render style put on the environment um mm -hmm. and that works like you know you get great games and great cartoons where they are one-to-one -one, but i love stuff like you know gravity falls and kind of the way yeah. that they do the very detailed very textured feeling backgrounds that still feel like a cartoon but the characters pop um and so kind of that that's kind of where we started going so i don't know if you ever saw like the e, the e3 build or the gamescom build we did like last year no um, i was there i was there oh, brilliant <laughs> but, like Obviously, that, that E3 and Gamescom build, like a lot of gameplay changed, but Feed the Fantasy was the first level. Um, mm -hmm. And so we'd really, you know, that build, we'd only been in production two or three months when people played that. Um, and kind wow. of, that we'd found kind of our style. But like, if you take a look now at Feed the Fantasy then and look at it now, like you can see, oh, yeah, it's the same level, but actually like these details have changed and like, oh, mm. they look at this texture approach and we're seeing more little VFX in the background and a better depth of field. Um, so I feel like we landed on the style very quickly, but, you know, not to peek behind the curtain of the Wizard of Oz, but we really were still iterating to get the final polish done really up until probably as late as like May, like but right before we went in, we were still touching up every level because we was, we, we still was kind of like, this little change here will make it better. This little change yeah. here will make it better. And so kind of from January to May of this year, um, we had the whole game. We like had a game laid out. And then at that point it was kind of like, okay, like how do we take this game from here to kind of here to now? Like, and so we landed on start to answer your question. We landed, <laughs> we landed. Take your time. Man. I'm loving it. <laughs> <laughs> we, we landed on style very quickly. The game, I, I would almost say it was like a real natural process to land on the style, but really, mm. The quality of the execution like we were we were working on from day one till the end like and we were always trying to find ways to better ourselves and then juggling that against trying to hit 60 frames per second on all devices nice nice um so one thing i also picked up on uh and this is how i, I could tell somebody at delala studios was a huge fan about Toast of Dragon. When you get, and I guess kind of spoiler, but when you get to the, the Dark Queen fight, the music changes <laughs> and it's the Battle Toes Double Dragon theme and then it mixes into the first level. I literally, I lost my shit. I was, <laughs> Cause like, that was my game when I was a kid. I absolutely, okay, there's Battle Toes Battle Maniacs, but Double Battle Tales Double Dragon because I'm a huge Double Dragon fan. When I heard that music, I jumped up. I was like telling my wife, I was like, they did it. It's the first <laughs> love on the main theme. She's like, of what? And I'm like, hold on, let me pause the game. And I pulled up, I pulled it up on YouTube and I played it. I'm like, that song modernized. And she's like, oh my God, it is. It's like, I I absolutely loved it. And that's one of the things with Battle Tales, it's always been prevalent. It's an amazing soundtrack. And like that song, like what makes you put that the 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 Battle of Double Dragon theme and the first level theme in like mixed into that boss fight? Like what 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 made you do that? So like composition wise, like full credit goes to David Houston. So David mm -hmm. Houston, like you know, longtime friend of mine, collaborator on a few things we've worked on together. So as soon as we got this, there was. There was no auditions. There was no one else. Like Dave, I rang up Dave. I was like, "We've got Battle Toad. You're doing the music. Um, <laughs> I suppose I'll have to pay you." Um, <laughs> and kind of, Dave was the one. Like so, like I said to you before, right? Like I love the old games, but I was very mm -hmm. keen to like not rely on them. So I said to mm -hmm. Dave, "I said Dave, like, look, give me a whole new score. I want a whole new score for the whole game. I, you know, we we spoke about style, and I, I said to him, like, you know." The style is going to be eclectic because the gameplay is, but when we're doing the rock stuff, I really want it to be really cheap, like the Power Rangers theme, over the top 80s with solos that don't need to be there. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> and Dave, like Dave turned around and said, look, you know, I think we would be doing a disservice to the game and to the fans if we didn't include some new versions of old ones, basically. Like, And so I said, okay, I said, well, look, if we're doing that, then 
I don't want to go back and listen to the old games. I want you to just, when I send you a level and we talk through it, you send me a track. And like, if I recognize it, awesome. But like, don't feel you have to tell me. So yeah. I hadn't played Battletoad Double Dragon. I mean, probably, yeah, probably nearly 27 years, maybe. Mm-hmm. So, um, so yeah, when does, I heard that. It, feel like that, it doesn't feel like it's been that long. I mean, it's been longer, right? It's crazy. Right? <laughs> I think what about Toad Double Dragon was 91, 92, like horrendous, yeah. right? Um, but yeah, so like when I heard that and I started feeling nostalgic, I was like, oh, what, what's this one? And he was like, yeah, this, this is why you feel nostalgic. Um, so like there is, obviously David Wise did the original soundtracks for the games and mm-hmm. you know, they're masterclasses, those games. Those old games are masterclasses in how you can take not a lot of room in on a cartridge and make midi sound like a rock like mm-hmm. rock track um and i think dave our david did maybe five of the old tracks from across the games reimagined um but yeah like i'd love to sit here and tell you because battle toad double dragon was my favorite i insisted on that but dave was the one who was like this level the best thing for this level is this song and this this is my version of that song and this is why it will work um and, you know I think every review, whether it's good or bad, the the one consensus has been that the soundtrack fucking bangs. Like it does. Uh, <laughs> it does. I had a great conversation with Rare. I think it was only this week or last week, so I think people can anticipate like the full soundtrack will be coming to streaming platforms. Um, mm-hmm. And I think you know, I think people have heard like the five track, but I think Housden did about and you know he did about a, an hour and a half of music for the game. Um, wow. So, like I'm hoping that full thing comes out soon. But yeah, like that's that's all him, dude. Like. Dave is, is incredible. Like, I love the guy. You know, I hope to work with him for the rest of my life. But he mm-hmm. he was the one who really did the justice by saying some of these levels need new versions of the old songs. Um, yeah. So that, that's all him. Nice, nice, nice. And um, one of the things I, w- I want to ask about is, like, with the, the story, um, a lot of people seem to be shocked with the direction of the story in the sense of not realizing that there is a continuity with Battletoads. Um, but what made you decide to place it, you know, 25 years after uh, the original? Well, I mean, aside from it literally having been that long, but <laughs> like it, as far as like with the continuity of the story, like um, and, and coming up with that theme that it went with, like, was that hard coming up with a new plot line? Cause it just, uh, I, I loved it. I felt like I was watching one of the best cartoons, <laughs> you know, like from my childhood. So, but it, it worked. It really worked. But, uh, you know, let me, let yeah. me ask you. <laughs> I hope you don't mind me keep name dropping the team members, but like, Dude, I, go for it. It's very easy in my job that I end up taking credit for other people's work. Um, so, one of my good friends, a guy called Tom Kaufman, who was our lead writer. So Tom was one of the lead writers on Rick and Morty for the first three seasons. Um, wow. And then our writing team were like his friends, so Kelsey Abbott and Wade Randolph, and both of those have done kind of stuff like community and Cartoon Network shows. Um, me and Tom had been looking for a game to do together for years, and when this come up, similar to with Dave, I rung up Tom's like, we've got Battletoads, they're really giving us carte blanche here. Like, I know you... You tend to do original stuff but would you be interested um and tom was up for it and kind of tom flew over from los angeles and we spent two weeks where it was just me and tom locked in a room trying to figure out like what is the what is the big arc like what is the story we're trying to tell um mm-hmm. and we, we'd had little discussions about this before and like it was really important for me that i love self-aware stuff and like i know people hate fourth wall breaking self-referential stuff but I love it, man. Like for me, like I love when something I'm immersed in, like acknowledges my existence or acknowledges (laughs) the the, the absurdity of their own existence. Um, And with Battletoads, like there's a rabid fan base that I was one of, Mm. but I was very aware that like majority of the people probably don't know what Battletoads is. Like, you know, if you don't have stuff put in your face every day for years upon years, like you forget about it because in the last 26 years, man, like we've had the Matrix, we've had the Marvel Cinematic Universe, we've had yeah. two sets of Star Wars trilogies. Like that's the stuff that's always in your face and never leaves. Um, and the Toads for me, like we knew their character profile straight away. We knew that like 
when we thought about them, Rash was the guy who was, you know, he, he almost knew he was a cartoon. He was very absurd. He wasn't really completely all there. Zitz mm-hmm. was this eccentric, paranoid leader. And Pimple was the big bruiser who didn't want to be a big bruiser. Like, mm-hmm. I, I'm not, I didn't want to play. I wanted to kind of more of like a, a Luke Cage. Do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like, you know, he fights because he has to fight because it's the right thing to do. Yeah. Um, and I thought what worked better than the idea that everyone's forgotten them. It's been 26 years. They think they're famous and they're not. And like, how do, how do free egos who have based their whole existence around being famous deal with the fact they're not famous? Well, Mm -hmm. maybe two of them get on with life and get jobs, but rash, that was never going to be rash. Like rash, the idea of not being famous, like he insinuates it, right? Like is his life worth living if, if they can't be heroes? Um, and so kind of like we knew from the start that like the main arc for this had to be the Toads were famous. They're not famous. They try to regain fame and regaining fame has a bad effect. Um, and so kind of that was that was the main arc. And then like the, the individual arcs were kind of like, you know, we worked very much on like the Dan Harmon story circle. Like, everything was cyclical. Like mm-hmm. it's, you know, it's act two is very zits, you know, pride and prejudice it's. I apologize for that pun name. It's mine. Um, <laughs> like this, this idea of like, you know, he's, his whole identity is being a leader. So when DQ threatens that and like mm. his pride takes over and what would have been a really easy mission? Like if doc, if DQ had gone in with spoiler alert, if DQ had gone in and just spoke to Jeff, mm-hmm. they would have got the plans and you would have missed the whole of act three, Like right? You wouldn't need act three, but what actually happens is because he's so fragile, they get into this loop of, oh my God, now we're fixing everything. Um, and then Rash was all about the fame and he had to be the one who had to make the big decision once they had the fame. And with Pimple, like you can't repress, you can't repress this anger and this resentment towards your brothers. Are they brothers? We never talk about it. Like, um, <laughs> You can't I repress that forever. <laughs> yeah, I, I love that. that's all. That's all. Kaufman and Kelsey and Wade, man. Like that joke. I love that recurring joke. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so kind of we knew very early that you know we wanted the main arc to be like they were famous. The, the previous games happened. Like they were the biggest. Yeah. They were the heroes of the galaxy. But there's a lot better heroes now. And in fact, they're nobodies. Um, and we wanted it to be they couldn't live with that, and they had to fight to try and get that fame back. But at what cost? Um, but did I, I, I'd love to tell you from day one, we knew we were, I wanted to do a weekend at Bernie's homage with act two mm-hmm. and like that stuff was all the magic on that, like came off the page from kind of our conversations and then the writers writing. Um, but dude, I love, I love the writing. I love the acting. Like, honestly, what, what a dream for me, man, getting to work with writers are some of my favorite shows, some of my favorite actors, you know, and just the fact that it works so well with the rest of the game, like that was always, that was the risk, right? Cause like yeah. with the writers, like I didn't make them write a game. Like I, they wrote it like they'd write a cartoon. They wrote scripts. They'd give me scripts. I'd then translate that into game. And sometimes they would be like, Hey, like it'd be really good at this point we could do something in space. And we'd be like, Oh shit. You know what? We've, we've actually want to do a shmup bit anyway. Like if we move the shmup from here to here mm-hmm. and then, up, then other times it would be like, so I've got this idea where you surf on an unconscious diplomat in kind of a bobsled level. And then they'd be like, okay, yeah, we can work that in. Like, that's not, yeah, that's fine. Um, I love that level too. <laughs> that's, that's my, it's one of my favorite, that in emergency stage, man, I love those levels. They're just absurd. And like Grant, our lead designer, like that's all him mistreated. Like that's his, like that track is all him. And it's so, ridiculous and the animations are ridiculous and yeah like it's it's a stupid stupid game (laughs) (laughs) oh man so so um with uh so so oh man i feel like we i don't even know where to go from here because i'm like man we're just having such a great conversation so okay all right so here's a question i have um is there potentially going to be online co-op because i know a lot of people have been wanting that as a feature um i'm fine with couch co-op but that that is a question i know a lot of people have asked me to to ask you so 
yeah, I mean, like, there's no plans right now. Um, okay. I can't say long term whether that will change. Um, you know, I don't want to be defensive. Like, what I'd love to tell you is, you know, and I've not had a chance to say this. I'm not even sure if I'm meant to say this yet. But like, mm -hmm. with a game like ours, if we'd known we wanted to, like, we decided couch co from day one. If we decided multiplayer from day one a lot of different decisions would have been taken. Like mm -hmm. speed is one thing. Like if you're trying to play like our combat, the speed it is, and there's any lag, like if two of you tongue an enemy at the same time and there's lag, there's issues. Yeah. The space shooter, like with any like lag, it becomes a problem. Um, yeah. You know, we would have been talking about just using it and it would have only on the, the scope we had, it would have just been peer to peer. It would never have been like a server based. So it, it wouldn't have been to standard. Um, and in terms of adding it now, like all those problems would be alleviated and it would, you know, Battletoads isn't one game, like really, like when you play a different game mode, there wasn't a ton of shared code, right? There wasn't shared animations. They were really like almost 11 different games. Um, mm -hmm. and so it means trying to do online for 11 different games. Um, I understand people are pissed, man. Like, and like, I'm sorry that people are upset that haven't been able to share it. And like, obviously no, we had no idea two years ago, there were going to be a lockdown and a pandemic, yeah. and like, you know, um, but we, we did from day one, like, you know, this was always a couch co-op thing and that does, and it affected design changes. It meant that like there was trolley things you do to each other in the game naturally that we wouldn't been able to do if you were playing with strangers. Um, mm. But like I said, this isn't, people can still give me all the abuse and the hate they want because they're frustrated and all they, I'm never going to be mad that people want to play the game with like their friends who they can't see. Um, but yeah, like all I can tell you right now is the Lala aren't working on anything for it. Um, you know, I, I love the fact we made a couch co-op game, you know, a large percentage of our players have played couch co-op and what the positive I'd like to say to people is, is like, we've seen a lot of families playing together that I don't know if they would have been, if, you know, the, the dad or the brother could have played online with friends. Like they might not have played it with their kids or they might not yeah. have played it with their siblings. Um, but yeah, like, like I said, man, a hundred percent understand why people are mad and just know that like, it was never bad intent. It was never anyone not caring about the game enough to do online co-op. It was, it was a design decision from day one for, two years in advance of us knowing we were going to be in a lockdown. Yeah. It's, um, and this one of the things like I really want to dive into as well is like, as a, you know, a studio and as a game creator, how, I guess from the industry side of it, how catastrophic has this pandemic been for you guys? Because I think a lot of fans don't seem to understand how, globally the pandemic has affected every game company in the world and while yes you know people want games asap they want hardware asap we're in a pandemic that's still affecting people being able to work you know having to work remotely if people can even do that so from your experience like how has it affected you guys yeah i mean like you said, dude, like first and foremost, like it's been horrible for the world. Like, you know, yeah. no one's happy about this. And like, we're very lucky we were able to continue doing our jobs. Like, so I think on a grand scale of things with the La La, we were very lucky because it came at the last few months. You know, we were basically polishing, we were bug fixing, we were getting ready for certification. Um, the big knock on for us, the pandemic caused, was the fact that we were making a couch co-op game that for the last mm -hmm four or five months of we couldn't play together like you know we we could get we've got Dalala house which is like four of our team actually live together mm -hmm. so that, they could do a little bit of multiplayer testing for us but none of them were programmers so none of them could give you know we couldn't do any multiplayer testing with a programmer there um and so what it meant was that like you know myself um mark our it director who's um who's my best friend of 20 years Mm -hmm. Craig, who works for Mark and is another school friend, like we were all in our bubble together anyway because we were like our closed friendship group. So what would be happening is like to test the game, we'd build the game at like two in the morning. Three of us would come into the studio. Ben, our tech director, would get up in London and remote in so he mm -hmm. could monitor the game to see what issues we had because all the optimization work 
happened when we couldn't play in a room together. Um, yeah. But, dude, we, we got to make our game. We got to finish it. It got to get released. We're very lucky. And, like, games fans are super passionate, super passionate. And, like, that passion sometimes doesn't come out in positivity, but I, it's it's all... Like, I, I understand people's frustration, but, like, nobody makes a game and is happy when it's delayed, like, unless it's for quality. And, like, you know, you yeah. see Halo Infinite getting delayed. Like, 343 wouldn't have wanted that, right? Like, 343, yeah. yeah. there's no way in the world 343 would have been sat there going, oh, I really hope we miss the launch window for the new gen. Like, we all just want to make games that people love and enjoy and, like, you know, so when this, the way this has hit the industry as in terms of us making games, um, has been crazy. It's been unprecedented, right? Um, yeah. And I think actually we're not going to see the real effect of that until the next year. Yeah. But we don't know how many games have slipped because there's no point in people telling us now that a game that hasn't been announced yet that was due out in April is slipping to July. Do you know what I mean? Um, mm -hmm. I think next year we'll see it more. Uh, but as far as the Lala, yeah, our biggest challenge, man, it was not being able to play the game together, not being able to test it together, not being able to have a QA team in yeah. a room to test it together for a lot of it. Um, but our amazing IT and ops department got us moved from completely in-house to completely remote in two days. Everyone worked their asses off. We had no, like, we had more issues with people needing to stop to work than we did with worrying about productivity. Um, and the game got through certain it came out and like we slipped internally on our timelines a tiny amount but the game still came out as intended um so Delala were very lucky and i'm super grateful for that but yeah like all i can say to people listening is that like all, all we do as game creators all we want to do is make stuff for people to play so anything that ever affects that like no one enjoys that like there's no game studio that has slipped because of this pandemic where they're like I'm really glad a pandemic happened so that my game didn't come out on time. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. 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 You know, and I, and I have a lot of friends in the games industry from, you know, various studios and, and people that are either working on the games or working in the PR, the marketing department, or it's, and, and this is something I really want to emphasize to you guys, the audience, like this is something you should understand, you know, as AJ saying, nobody, wants their game delayed nobody wants their hardware delayed it's you know it's enough dealing with deadlines and, and pressure to meet those deadlines as it is but then having a pandemic which is affecting people's ability to work on things that just makes it way way harder so just you know and and i'm asking you the audience and you know those who will watch this and who will listen to it uh, please be understanding of that. You know, this is, I understand as gamers, literally, we are very passionate, but have not only that passion, but have compassion as well for the industry that is severely impacted by this. So, yeah. And, and um, yeah, it, it doesn't matter how big or small you are, dude, like hundreds of millions doesn't change the fact that if you're used to being in a room together and you're not in a room together, like, Battle Toads didn't cost hundreds of millions. I mean, like your Halos, your Activision games. Yeah. Like, you know, it's very easy to be angry at corporations because you think they're rich and money solves problems. But like, you know, the problems we had that we occurred as a 23 person studio, like mm -hmm. you, have to you can multiply that by 10, 20, 30, 40 for these bigger studios, right? Yeah, definitely, definitely. Um, one of the questions I want to ask you about, uh, is there any possibility for a modern battle to this double dragon? I know arc system works has the IP for double dragon, but I think it would be pretty awesome to, to, to let, have them let you guys have a crack at that. I would love to see it personally. <laughs> I mean, look, I would love to play it. I would love to have a new version of that game. Um, like, in terms of possibility, like, obviously, Delala, we don't own Battletoads. Rare and Microsoft do. Um, all I could tell you is if I got a call tomorrow and it was Microsoft and Rare and they were like, hey, we've just spoke to Ark. You know, we want to do a Battletoad Double Dragon together. Are you interested? Like, it'd be very unlikely my answer would be no. 
Like, you know, <laughs> it would be awesome to do something like that. You know, crossovers are really fun if you do them right. And I think I, me- I mentioned on another podcast, actually, like one of the things I like, you know, is it also gives you opportunity to maybe partner with people. Like I'd love mm-hmm. to do, that sort of, you know, if you, if you imagine like we took battle toads and then way forward, we're doing the double dragon side and we work together. Like, mm-hmm. I think there's great opportunity there, but um, yeah, I mean, I, I would love to play a new battle toads double dragon. I'd love to make one. Um, will it ever happen? I, I'm afraid I've got no more idea than you do. On that. <laughs> you might even know better. Like, <laughs> <laughs> No, I'm I'm actually uh, I'm friends with Adam Turney from uh, Way Forward, and uh, I know it's one of the things. Like when I was talking to him, he's like, "Man, I would love to do a Baltos Double Dragon." So it's like that. Okay, so for the audience, the interest is there. It's just the <laughs> opportunity hasn't presented itself, but that that would be that would be awesome to see you guys work together on that. Um, but yeah, man. Um, aside from that, is there anything? Uh, going for like any uh other projects you guys are working on that you may or may not be able to speak about uh if you can't it's fine i understand ndas um but yeah yeah i mean yeah so there's no no projects i can speak about at the moment um you know we came off battle toads it was a big two years of our life um you know the studio like the guys and girls took a couple of weeks off to recover and um we've really been easing into it we're trying to find our feet as like you know when are we all going to be back in the studio? Like, I'm back in the studio full time, but the team aren't. Um, mm-hmm. And so we're just trying to find our feet with that at the moment. We're taking the opportunity to get some stuff done to the office that we couldn't do with 23 people stomping about. Um, but to be honest, man, we're just like, we're living on the high of having Battletoads out there. Like it's, it's so exciting to have the game out there, not just because we loved working on it, but because as you know, so many games you work on don't see the light of day. So when mm. you do get a game and it actually comes out and the people play it, like it's just awesome. Um, and so, yeah, like all I can say is thank you to everyone that tried it. Even the people that didn't like it, thank you for trying it in the first place. Like, um, but yeah, hopefully I'll be able to talk some more about what we're doing next soon. And hopefully I'll be able to come back and we can have a chat on that. Definitely, definitely. We'd love to have you back on the show. Uh, how is the, um, I guess from your perspective, how is the, fan reaction been to Battletoads? Like, has it been primarily positive or has it been mixed or, you know, what is the, I guess, fan interaction that you've experienced personally been so far? I mean, it's, it's much, much more positive than I ever expected. Um, mm-hmm. You know, the, the response to the E3 trailer last year was largely negative. People were very angry about the designs, the dark queen, which was anticipated. Like we knew that was going to happen. Um, I don't think what I anticipated though was when we released the trailer this year for the date, how overwhelmingly positive the response was. Like it was, like I wasn't really prepared for that. Um, and so on Twitter, like there's still negatives, but like mainly every day we're getting people to show, you know, the result, the end complete screen gets sent to us or pictures of families playing together. Um, so I just felt a lot of love. The team, I felt a lot of love. Um, and that's amazing. And like, it's like I said, like I really appreciate all the, the negatives as well. Like I've, criticism is super important for growth. Um, and it just shows you that there is such a passion for this franchise. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, like if you'd asked me this time last year, I would have expected 70, 30 negative. Mm-hmm. And I, I could pretty confidently say that it's actually probably more like 70, 30 positive, like in terms of like what I see on Twitter. Wow. That's that's great, man. No, I, like I said, I absolutely love the game. Like it, it, it hit every notch of being a Battletoads game for me. So, uh, I want to say to you, thank you and your team for making such an amazing game because I absolutely loved it start to finish. Um, and I can't wait to see what else you guys do. You know, from original IPs to whatever else you're gonna work on. I'm looking definitely looking forward to it. And shifting gears. We talked about that. So let's talk about you. How, <laughs> uh, like, w- what are things that, you know, you're passionate about outside of, outside of video games? Yeah. I mean, I'm a pretty simple fella. Like, um, video games has obviously been a massive part of my life, both as a mm-hmm. creator and a consumer. Um, like stuff I like personally, like I still enjoy wrestling. Like I was a WWE kid and I'm still kind of like, you know, I'm enjoying AEW. Um, mm-hmm. 
it was a big moment for me when a wrestler from AEW was tweeting me about playing Battletoads. Like that was awesome. Like wow, uh, really? Yeah, Evil <laughs> Uno, give a shout out to Evil Uno. Like that was that was surreal for me. Um, so yeah, I still enjoy wrestling. Like watching wrestling. Um, love television. Like because I don't get a ton of free time at sociable mm. hours. Like me and my partner Harry. Um, like me and her will kind of just what consume a lot of television. Like a lot of people are during the pandemic, but like. Mm. You know, sitting on the sofa with Harry, with our pug Hugo, and just like binging. We just didn't. We just watched Misfits all the way mm-hmm. through. Um, so yeah, like a lot of my stuff is media based. Like I love like wrestling. I love TV. Um, and then the, the the cliche stuff. You know, I love business based audio books. Like you know the Bob Iger audio book and the Ed Catmull, and I love Lego. Um, I'm I'm very very simple. Like you know, most of my life is Dalala and if I wasn't making games as a career, I'd probably be making them as a hobby in my spare time anyway. So kind of mm-hmm. my, my life is all consumed by the company. Um, but yeah, I, I, I just, the, the simple pleasures in life, man, and food. God damn. I love food. <laughs> like, yeah. You know, what's some, what's some of your favorite foods? Oh man, I'm an easy man to please. Like you put Mexican in front of me, you put Japanese in front of me, like, yeah. And, uh, you know, it doesn't have to be that high class stuff. It can literally be like, chuck me a Wagamama, like chuck me some old El Paso kits and I, I'm easily pleased. Um, and pizza, like, you know, I was in a band for years, like me and my, in fact, like me, my lead designer, Grant, and the composer, David Halston, we're in a band mm. together for years. And like, wow, we just used to live off pizza and, yeah, in living in our old grotty school minibus. Yeah, it was, uh, <laughs> yeah, the good old days of, of youth. <laughs> <laughs> man, if you ever come out here to Hawaii, I will be treating you to some great food, man. Oh. It doesn't matter what it is. Japanese, Mexican, Italian, Indian. Dude, we have it all here. And uh, yeah, let me know when you come out here to Hawaii. Oh, I, I will take care of you. <laughs> when, when all this is blown over, I'll take you up on that. Hey, if you need a place to stay, I got a five bedroom <laughs> house. I'm right outside of Waikiki, so let me know. <laughs> I'll, I'll be there the day after the lockdown's lifted. <laughs> oh man, um, one of the other things, like, um, dude, like, oh god, see, see, I'm loving this conversation. I'm trying to to stay like I, I'm okay. So here's the thing: like every time I'm, I'm wanting to ask a question, I'm like, is this gonna take two? Because I, I know it's late for you. And don't, I, don't, I def- <laughs> don't worry about me, man. Like, you know, ask what you want. And if I waffle for too long, you just tell me to wrap it up. But like, yeah, you ask whatever you want to ask, man. No, 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 dude. I, 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 I love this conversation. Like, I, that's why I'm like, don't feel like you got to stop talking. I'm over here. Just like, is it too, is it getting too late for you? What? Yeah. <laughs> good, dude. I, I was, I was de- doing one of these last night till about midnight. So, you, I mean, it's only 8 PM. So we are fine. Don't you worry about that. <laughs> So, um, I was going to say like, when it comes to like, uh, uh, gaming, have you noticed that there's like a huge difference between those of us who grew up gaming eighties and nineties and early two thousands versus the current generation? Cause it's like, it, it seems like gamers now, and you know, this is not knocking the, I like to call them the Fortnite generation. Like they like that. They like the games as a service idea versus the, uh, playing solo single player or co-op you know couch co-op games it just seems like the culture of gaming has definitely changed especially since gaming has gone mainstream and i like and dislike that it's gone mainstream because i feel like it's while it has grown a lot of positives it's grown more negatives as well i guess there's probably like a, a balance or maybe there's like a 70 30 as well for that but it's like how do you feel like with the change in game i know i'm saying this is a super long question but <laughs> i think you get what i'm saying <laughs> no definitely look um i don't think gaming has changed as much as how we do it has been able to change like yeah gaming has always been social we we grew up where we didn't have online gaming you know yeah and so we, but we were still social. Like even I remember I was talking about it this week, Resident Evil 2, I played mm-hmm. with two of my buddies, like one play a game, but we did levels and lives, you know, and we played that together. Um, and when we played Battletoad, right, we just played it on the couch together. Um, but like if there had been online gaming and like I could have had 
24 seven access to my friends like school and then we could have played games around each other's houses for an hour and then we could have played for another few hours i, I would 100 percent been on it i mean i was at university like I, it was very hard for us to all meet up because people mm -hmm. had jobs people are off of school but we jump on halo and we play online for hours um and i think gaming has always been this social activity and it's just that how social works now is different like yeah and the problem with that is like it's not just about playing with your friends anymore you're playing with strangers and it's the same way that like if you were playing a basketball game you know i loved i played a lot of bas basketball in high school like i would talk shit to the other team right yeah. I, that was part of the game that was one of my favorite one of my favorite bits was before <laughs> started, you're running drills and you were just talking shit when you get near the halfway mark right um the difference is now is that like people tell you they've had sexual intercourse with your mother all night or when you play games online right yeah, <laughs> yeah. um and it's the same with twitter like I, I think people feel that there's a lot more negativity in the games industry because of twitter but i think it's actually there's always been negativity you can mm -hmm. just hear it now like yeah yeah when i made games when i first got into it like you know 15 years ago there wasn't really that platform where like everyone could just say how much they hated you or hate what you were doing, but they still existed. Like those people still existed. They just didn't have a way to put their voice. Um, so yeah, like, you know, Fortnite's your Minecraft, your things like this is it's, it's amazing in a lot of ways because it's allowing people to connect, but like, there's no filter. You, you've got, you've got to take the good with the bad with all of mm -hmm. these evolutions for technology. And like, you know, the second that, two people that have never met can talk to each other. Me and you have had a great conversation. We can chat. We're getting on really well. If we'd met on Halo 10 years ago, we could have been talking shit to each other. You know what I mean? <laughs> For real. Like, um, so yeah, I think it's, I would like to think that it's not that there's more negativity in the world. It's just now they've got a megaphone for that negativity. Um, yeah. and, you know, but the, the counter side of that is it is a shame that outside of these circumstances with the pandemic it is a shame that maybe people revert to to online before they go for same room like i mm. think that there's still a magic about playing games in a room with your friend uh, or with a group of friends mm -hmm. you know bomberman like playing bomberman like six of you playing bomberman was one of my favorite things when i was a kid um so so yeah like i i, I don't think that like we were less negative. I think that we didn't necessarily have the platform to be negative or the games that made us competitive against each other, because I think it was more about working together about, you know, about levels and lives about yeah. kind of taking turns. Um, but yeah, man, like I, I was a pig on Halo. I was, a, you know, we were just talking more smack than we were playing. Like <laughs> even if we, were, if we were losing, we weren't going to lose the smack talking. We'd get in that lock <laughs> off the game. You know, we'd be in there being like, oh, we're so bad. We're so, and they, the other team would get confused and then we'd flip it on them. Like, yeah, like, <laughs> um, yeah. So I think I think negativity is just on megaphone now. Yeah, man, it, it's just one of those things too. Like when I, um, okay, so like for me, like I, I love playing fighting games, right? So if I'm playing online, dude, I talk so much trash. And I've had people tell me, they're like, oh, you're so mean. And I'm like, Dude, in the arcades back in the day, even if you were getting your ass kicked, you were talking. You had to talk shit. You know, <laughs> it was just the culture. And I can understand, like, a lot of people getting into it now, like, they, they, and they may not be used to it. But I'm like, I don't really think there's malicious intent in that sense. It's just, it's gaming sportsmanship, I guess you could say. <laughs> like, you know, if you recorded a game of Call of Duty and you played back the the communication between people and you put it over the top of an NFL game, people probably wouldn't know the difference, right? Because those mm -hmm. players probably talk just yeah. as much smack, just as much horrible stuff about each other. Um, yeah. And it's within reason as well. Like you've got, there's a reason ratings exist on games. Like you mm -hmm. can't, you've got to be careful how early you introduce kids to that environment, or at least, yeah. you know, make sure that you've prepared them for it because, they're going to hear bad words on the playground, but I think they're probably more likely to hear them if they play games online. And I think kind of 
as an industry, you know, we do all we can. We work with the ratings boards. You know, they give us back our ratings. We make sure that kind of everything's covered. Like, we get massive fines. Like, if we if we were to submit battle toads to the ratings board and we didn't tell them we were doing some stuff, like, we just get a massive fine when they find out. So, like, mm-hmm. but then the other side of that is, you know, it's responsible playing. Like, people need to know when they need to take a break. They know need to know they, when the content is applicable to them. Um, and parents need to keep an eye on things like, you know, the same way you wouldn't let your kids just browse the internet. Like you can't really just let them play online with strangers. Um, yeah. But yeah, like it's, I mean, we're gamers are just anyone competitive. It's like you said, right. It's no different to the arcade. It's no different to a pool game. It's no different to a football game. It's, it's exactly the same. Like you put people in competitive environment and they'd be horrible to each other, but, I think if those same people thought they genuinely hurt someone, they'd all be, they'd all take it back. Do you know what I mean? Like when you're talking smack to someone while you're playing street fighter, I bet if you heard them actually crying, you'd stop talking smack. Right. Yeah. Because you're like, yeah. well, look, you know, I'm really sorry. Like, you know, this is, it's part of the game. Um, yeah. But yeah, it's, it's easy. It's easy to forget everything when, you know, the internet is just whoever you're talking to, you don't see their face. You don't know they exist. They're just the gamer tag. They're just like, you know, internet troll underscore 12. Like, yeah. Yeah. And, and definitely with, uh, especially with Twitter, um, <clears throat> I, I've found, you know, going back to like what you were saying, like with Twitter, with how it, it literally is having a lot of people with a megaphone to talk about what they're unhappy with. Uh, it's, well, and what they also enjoy as well, but it's it's very interesting the social dynamic of using social media these days. Like how, I mean, you think about it. Ten years ago, social media had just started kicking up, and it wasn't to the point where it is now, where everyone's on it. Um, it is very interesting. I guess you could say like the social dynamics of how people interact on it, especially what. I, feedback I've gotten from my friends that work in the gaming industry, how they have to deal with negativity or positivity, uh, this, things and how you respond to the uh, people who are incredibly negative or whether or not you, you know, maybe you have to block them. Maybe you have to just not say anything. Um, it's, I guess from your perspective, like how is that pressure? Because it seems like it could be pretty, pretty taxing. Yeah, I mean, I've fallen in love with the mute button on Twitter. (laughs) Same here. You know, when we announced at E3 last year and the response was negative, I stayed up the entire night and I read every single tweet and I was a mess. I didn't sleep. I came into the conference hall at like 6 a.m. Mm. and I sat in the dark and I sat there and I played the game and I was like I was like I was like this game's great I was like why am I so obsessed with the hate I'm getting from these people that have never played it I'm sitting here playing it and I'm loving it like I need to deal with this and then mm-hmm. when we got close to release this time around I started using the mute button and it was like it's not because I just want to hear the positivity. I don't mind constructive criticism, but when it's just maliciousness or like, you know, negativity for the sake of it, I will mute those people. I won't block them. Like, I don't. I don't want them to have the satisfaction of being blocked. Um, Cause some people get off on that. Strangely, yeah. <laughs> I see it as a badge of honor, and then it encourages more people to try and get blocked. Um, I just mute them and then I let them go and then let them blow hot air. And it's horrible, dude. And it's like, because it does affect you. Like I can read a hundred positive reviews and one negative and all I'll think about is a negative. Like, you know, all I'll think about is that horrible thing that someone said. I won't think about the positivity. I'll just think about that negativity. Um, so I just use the mute button a lot. Sometimes a little bit too much. Like I'll go get a little bit heavy handed. Um, <laughs> But like, yeah, like it, it's weird, man. And there are people that have it much, much harder. Like I've seen friends in the industry at much bigger companies and people game play, you know, us gamers, like there's this feeling of ownership, like the game and the characters belong to us, you know, mm-hmm. like, you know, we own that. It belongs to us. And that goes hand in hand with this attitude of, well, 
I buy the video game, so I pay your salary, so you work for me. And it's like, that's not that's not how this works. Like, mm-hmm. you don't own these characters. We own these characters. Like, you know, and when you turn around and you say, you know, we didn't really have this, but we see it with Last of Us, right? You know, Ellie wouldn't say that. Joel wouldn't do this. Well, if Neil Druckmann's saying Ellie and Joel would do it, then they would because they're his yeah. characters, right? They're his, like, when I've been given control over Rash, Pimple and Zits, like, Rash would say that because we've written Rash to say that. Like that mm-hmm. is we've as the the current gatekeepers for those characters at this point in time. Like we we decided that that is something he would say. Um, and like you don't pay the game to like you don't pay the salaries. Like hell, when you buy a game for sixty dollars, like those game developers don't see hardly any of that money. Like if any at all. Um, but like it's not because, and I don't think it's entitlement. I think it's just it's that. Game, gamers are just so passionate, like so passionate and don't necessarily filter it or point it in the right direction. But like, yeah, it, it's just hard, man. It's hard because people feel like they own this stuff. It belongs to them. And when you feel that way, you're not very much willing to listen to logic or reason because in your head, you're like, I'm angry because you've done something against me. Like you've done this personally to me. Like I don't like this and you've done it to me. Well, it's never about that. It's never about that person or that person. It's it's just an expression of the creative people on that team. Yeah. yeah. And, and um, yeah, like when I, you know, when I was working with Sony to, you know, they were giving out the codes for Last of Us 2 for reviewers and I got my code and I did my review. Uh, I did a positive review. Like I, I said, there are some negatives to it. Like there are some, with any game, like it's, no game is perfect. You know, and I point that out, but like my approach to reviewing games goes back to like reading like electronic gaming Ma- monthly back in the day or game pro where you would talk about the game, but you would talk about how much fun you had, you know, how much fun was it? And then if there were negatives, you would talk about it, not lots and minimize them, but there would be a section where you're talking about it that wouldn't construe being the entire review. And I feel like in that sense, that art has kind of been lost, especially with, content creators uh youtubers particularly that you know it's just oh this is my opinion blah 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 blah. okay cool that's your opinion but put it in a constructive way because i feel like and i've always said this because i've had other youtubers and creators reach out to me like oh you know i want to how do i work with the industry like you do how do i do this how do i reach out to this how do i be completely honest without being rude and i'm like well you can be honest and speak about what you didn't like, but that shouldn't spread to the entirety of your review. If it's just pure vitriol for the product, you got to think about it. One, if I'm a company looking at that, do I even want to work with you again? (laughs) You know, it's, it's, you can be honest without being a dick is what I've been trying to tell a lot of people. And I see a lot of people don't understand that method of reviewing um, and when I reviewed, uh, the last of us part two, I gave a positive review. I was like, mechanically, graphically, the game is good. Narratively. I actually looked like the decisions that they went with it. Could they have put the story in a different order, which would have made a little bit more sense? Yes, but I'm not Neil Druckmann. That's his game. That's his vision. But I got an insurmountable amount of hate to the point where I had to mute People on tw- I had to mute the thread on Twitter where I posted a review. I had to no longer respond to comments, which I'm still getting comments on it about how I'm stupid. Oh, they paid you. Look, companies can't, you cannot pay people to review games. It doesn't work that way. Um, and it's just, uh, it's wild. It's really wild. And, and I think the extent that a lot of people took it to where they were, you know, threatening Laura Bailey and the team. It, it's never that serious. Like it should never come to that point. No, no, never. No, n- no one deserves death threats. Like, you know, no one who's just creating an entertainment media for you to enjoy, like deserves to be threatened, to be, have their families threatened. Um, yeah. I mean, look, re- it, reviewing is hard, man. Like, you know, I don't envy you. I don't envy anyone because I actually think that, 
attention spans are a lot shorter and uh, you know yeah. as we've seen with the way the news has gone to this clickbait format i think people yeah. just want to ingest negativity when they watch this stuff like like and so i think that encourages it you know I, you might have seen that like zero punctuation did a horrendous review of battletoads but like i saw that as a badge of honor because his whole shtick is he's a horrible person in his reviews right he, you know, like, <laughs> yeah yeah you know, I don't think Microsoft would let me, but I'd love to have a box quote of uh, when you're not holding the run button, it feels like you're dragging your hairy testicles across a Velcro carpet. Like, that's <laughs> something he said, and I love that. Like, brilliant. Um, but, like, that's his thing. But, yeah, it, it is, it's weird for us when you see kind of reviews which feel like they've gone in very negative focused. And, like, I don't really understand the review process, man. I don't know how... Battletoads could get a hundred from VGC and then could get a forty from someone else. Like it, like because it's a wild west in a lot of ways. Like it mm -hmm. is, it's subjective. It's down to the tastes, and that's great. And that's what you need. You need a range of perspective. But yeah, it is like yeah. You know, when we do business stuff, you're told to get, you feed people a shit sandwich, right? You give them a compliment, you tell them negativity, and you give another compliment. And um. And I'm not saying that's how the journalistic approach should be, but I think like, I don't think I've ever played a game, even games I've hated, where I've not found something that I could talk positively about. Do you know what I mean? Like, and most of the time for games I don't like, it's, I know it's because I don't like them, but I can see that like, there's an audience for this and there are people mm -hmm. that will love this. And like, there's games, you know, me and uh, two of my friend Mark and Ben, who both work here, like we have shit game club and, shit game club isn't about playing sh shit games. It's because we're a shit game club. Like, and we play games that have got like really high ratings on meta and we always end up not getting on with them. And then we'll play something that's got a really bad score and we'll have a great time. And we're just like, we are the shittest game club that exists, but mm -hmm. we know what we like and you know, we know what we don't, but we don't sit there and go, we didn't get on with this game. This game's awful. We go, Oh, you know what? Like this isn't for us, but I can 100% see why people would love this thing or that thing. And like, I think everyone wants that. Everyone's, everyone wants every game to be a 10 out of 10. Like in their mind, they want to play every game. They've spent $60. They want it to be a 10 out of 10. And like, even most 10 out of 10s, like, I don't think I've ever played a perfect game. Like, I don't, just, just don't think it exists. Like, yeah, yeah. Mario 64 comes close for me, but the camera, right? You know? Yeah. But, doesn't stop it being one of the best games ever. You know, Metal Gear Solid series, Kojima's a genius, but those are flawed games that are 10 out of 10. Like, mm -hmm. I mean, yeah, it's it's weird, man. It's it's weird. People like to read and ingest negativity, like, about games and then spread that negativity on Twitter. But I, does it have any benefit? I don't know. Like, what would, what would the world look like if we only got positive reviews or, on, or if we only got honest reviews that weren't being dicks? Like... Would it be better? I mean, it sounds it sounds it to me. Like, do you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Like, I mean, because it's gotten to a point now. Like, I, when I, especially when I go on Twitter, if I or if I watch other YouTubers do reviews, sometimes I wonder, like, are you even enjoying gaming? Because it's like, it seems like you don't enjoy anything. And like, case in point, uh, with Let's see what 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 recently came out. Okay, Avengers, right? So, I you know I was working with Square Enix. They reached out to me to do a sponsor stream for that game and sponsor review. So I was streaming it on Twitch, and I constantly had people coming in like, "Oh, how terrible is this game? How terrible is it? This looks terrible." Blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, "Are you gonna buy it? No. So why do you care? Like, why are you just coming here seeking negativity?" Which kind of leads into my next question of what, why is it, I'm not sure if it's this generation or not, but why is it that with gaming, like when you, for you and I coming up, we would play a game. We'd go out, we'd actively, you know, what's the next game? We'd go out trying to play as many games as possible. This current generation, I guess that's correct to say, they're more into voyeurism in a sense of if a YouTuber or a journalist, whoever they like, says that something is terrible, they won't touch it. They're like, oh, yeah, you saved me money, blah, blah, blah. And I'm thinking to myself, but what if 
you would have liked it. I, I I don't I don't quite understand gamers these days with that that aspect. It's weird, man. It's like for me, I I try and think back. Like, okay, I used to get Games Master magazine, you know, PC mm -hmm. World, like. I wonder if they influenced me. Do you know what I mean? Like, I wonder if mm -hmm. I read the review in Games Master and it gave it a bad review, if I would not get it because of that. And yeah. now with hindsight, you know, depending on what review you read for our game, it either tells you it's an amazing game and it's worth playing or it's the worst thing to happen in 26 years, right? So, like, yeah. I wonder how biased I was by, you know, we didn't have an abundance of it. We just had magazines and whatever we could afford to buy magazine-wise. Um I think this the whole YouTube thing is really interesting and it's it's only happened over the course of my career. Um, there's something nice about it in a lot of ways. Like I think there's something nice about the fact that video games have become mainstream in the sense that people want to spend hours watching people play and talk about video games. Like people want to watch Twitch, they want to watch YouTube. Um, and that's great. And but it's like you said, it's um Anytime we're giving a platform to people, there's a lot of a lot of responsibility on those people that isn't their fault. Like mm -hmm. I don't like a bit as a YouTube, just like as a YouTube yourself, but if you put anything up on YouTube, you don't if you didn't like a game and you gave it a negative review, you're not doing that because you're telling everyone not to buy it. You're just giving your opinion, right? You're just saying to yeah. your viewers and your listeners on your podcast, like, hey, I tried this, I didn't like it, here's why I didn't like it. Um, and you know, I imagine that's like a lot of streamers and, and content creators. Like, I don't know if they necessarily are sitting there going, I really hope that I negatively impact sales. Um, mm -hmm. but yeah, like, I don't know, man. Like, if I went back and I read Games Masters from when I was a kid and I looked, I wonder, I'd be really interested to know, like, was my Christmas and birthday list the games that they said were good and I never bothered playing the games they said were bad? Um, but yeah, I just think it's incredible the power it has now, like the power that content creators have, whether they want it or not, or they know they've got it or not, like, yeah. you know, um, but at the same time, without them, you know, we wouldn't have stuff like esports as big as it is. And I never, you know, it was a massive moment for me when I walked around Gamescom in like maybe 2014, 2015, and like the first time I or like a merch stand for an esports team and they were selling jerseys and i was like oh my god like people support esports teams the same way that i support west ham the football team like mm. and that's massive for the industry so yeah like I, I have no idea like what the balance is like for all the negatives we get are we getting more positives is it equally now like how much impact a negative review from a youtuber has on people like i don't know how many people avoid battle toads because of zero punctuation and how many people have gone for it because IGN gave us a good review. Like it's, it's weird, man. And I think for us, it's strange because we're in the position our parents were in when we were kids. Like, yeah, like this is new. This is a little bit scary. Like why are they making magazines and TV programs about the games that my kid is playing? Like that's the position our parents are in. Right. But now mm -hmm. for us, like, why are people watching people play games instead of playing games themselves? Yeah. And I guess what I'd kind of ask you and I ask me is like, if YouTube and streamers had existed when we were kids, I wonder how much time we would have spent watching them and not playing. Like, do you know what I mean? Like, yeah. would we be, would we be the kids that we're talking about now? Like, I honestly don't know. And there's no way to know unless you've got a time machine. Um, yeah. Um, but yeah, like, I like to think that nothing is enough. Like, I'd love to think that there's more good coming out of this stuff than there is bad. And that I'm interested to know in 10 years what the kids we're talking about now will be saying about the next generation. Like, you know, yeah. but um, yeah, man, it's, it's it's weird how quickly stuff moves. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, One of my other questions I would have, I, I want to ask, like, winding down to the last two questions I have is, uh, one is what advice would you give to the audience here who may be interested in getting into the video game industry, be it uh, game design or you know whatever? Like, what with, with your advice, what what would it be for the, the audience? 
yeah um like it's, it's hard it's all consuming like you know when i worked for someone else i crunch now that i own my own company i try to avoid my team crunching but i'm i'm crunching still um mm. you know and crunch doesn't have to be a bad thing like you know crunch can but like longer hours aren't always a bad thing um but it's kind of like make sure you love this because if you if you try to do this and you don't love it like it is it's it's horrible because it takes everything from you like you know mm. i'm very lucky that i've got a very understanding partner like she's been with me since i was a you know at, in my first games job but like she knows like tonight like I, I i got here on this podcast one minute before it started because my last meeting over ran i ran i drove home i had dinner I watched one 20 minute episode of 30 rock. Then I got back in the car and come back for this podcast. And like the fact that I got home for dinner in between is a rarity. Like, you know, mm -hmm. um, and you know, if we hadn't been in pandemic, she probably wouldn't have seen me at the end of battle toads. Like we probably would have not seen each other hardly at all. Um, yeah. so just, yeah, my, my first piece of advice is just make sure that you love this, like, and make sure that it's something you can see yourself doing forever because it's, you know, you're going to give a lot to it. Um, and then secondly, it's like, as someone that hires people now, it's more important that you show you can do the job than it is you have a load of qualifications. Like, if you're going to be an artist, you'll be surprised how much a really strong portfolio of art will get you further than a degree. Um, mm -hmm. If you're a programmer, show you can program. If you're a designer, like, one of the best applications I ever saw, because a design portfolio is really hard, right? If you're if you're fresh in the industry and you've not worked on anything, but one of the best, best, best applications I ever saw, somebody took Uncharted 2 and then they said, you know, this is Uncharted 2 and then did level design proposals for it. So their like application was, if I was working on Uncharted 2, this is a level design proposal. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, like, when I was at uni, no one told me about portfolios. No one told me to work on portfolios. I've been to hubs and like, they focus on the now, they don't focus on the long term. Like, it's very easy to say to yourself, you know, I don't ever have time to do that. Like I'm at, I'm at school, I don't have time to do a portfolio. But like, as easy as it is for me to say now, like the biggest a bit of advice I can give is, if, you, if you've got time to play video games, you've got time to make video games. So like, mm -hmm utilize your time build a strong portfolio and like prove to people you can do the job by showing them examples of your work and that doesn't have to be published work that can literally be stuff you've done in your bedroom um but yeah they're, they're, the, they're the two biggest pieces of advice i'd give to anyone trying to get into the industry okay okay and is there anything you want to leave the audience with before we go um look i've said a lot of stuff i've said makes it look like there's a lot of negativity in making games or that like I feel negativity, you know, what I will say is this, I started this studio the 22nd of January, 2012. There's not been a single day I've woken up and not been excited to come to work. Like I do long hours because I want to do long hours. I want to give the company long hours. Um, sometimes this is a very hard industry to be in, but like, I genuinely believe I've got the best job in the world and like, I love making games. I love people playing games. I love people expressing opinions about games. Like, mm -hmm. yes, it'd be great if there was just a lot more love or a lot more consideration for what you're saying. But like, it's, it's a passionate industry um, and it's a passionate consumer industry as well. Um, so yeah, like just know that no one goes into a game to make a four out of 10. Like all of us want to make 10 out of 10s, whatever we're doing and whether mm -hmm. it doesn't come out that way or it does like, when you're playing something, you're playing love, you're playing years of somebody's life that they've given. Um, so just like, try to get a bit of focus and enjoy that. Like try to be like, you know what, this isn't for me, but this person has given a lot to this. So. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And I lied. I actually have one final question for you. Go for it. Did you have a good time? Oh, I loved it. It's been great, man. <laughs> it's been great. And like, I would love to come back again in the future. And like, if you ever want to talk to any of the other team members here, I'm sure they'd love to come on and have a chat. Like you probably have a great time with Dave Housden, our composer as well. He can talk to you about the difference between working on battle toads. Thomas was alone. Q to <laughs> like, yeah. So like, yeah, dude, it's great. You've been a fantastic host and I've loved the questions. Man, I'd love to. And honestly, I, I, I sincerely mean it, man. I would love to have you back on the show. Uh, you know, whenever you're available to come back on, I'd love to have your team on. I, I mean, I'd love to do a panel with all of you. 
Like, I think that would be a lot of fun to do that. And like I said, next thing, you know, if you ever come out here to Hawaii, I, I take care of you. I'm going to take you around. I'll take, I'll good take time. <laughs> Thank you. Like, man, if you're ever in the UK, please come and visit the studio. Like, we'd love to have you here. Definitely, definitely. And and where can people find you again? Yep. Yeah, so um, if you want to check out uh, Delala Studios, obviously on Twitter, it's at Delala Studios, which is D-L-A-L-A Studios. Um, DelalaStudios.com. And please, if you get a chance, check out Battletoads, available on, Games pa- on Game Pass on Xbox One, Windows 10, and also on Steam. Yeah, yeah. And I'll leave links to everything down in the description below for the podcast. And, you know... That, that's a wrap that's the show and if you guys enjoyed it um definitely make sure if you're watching this on youtube give it a thumbs up if you're listening to it on spotify or uh on apple Podcasts, make sure you leave a rating and just tell us what well not only just a rating but just tell us what you think of the show and that being said you can catch this episode along with many other episodes of the cast nova podcast on if you're watching you're gonna see me do this right here because it's all down here but you got <laughs> apple Podcasts, google Podcasts. Spotify, TuneIn Radio, iHeartRadio, Pandora, coming soon to Amazon Music, which they reached out to us to get our podcast on there, so it'll be coming there soon. And if you want to support the show, we have Patreon, so patreon.com slash Mikhail Casanova gets you early and exclusive access to the show and priority for your questions, as well as if you want to catch this in video format, we'll be able to you'll be able to catch it on twitch.tv slash Mikhail Casanova and on youtube.com slash Mikhail Casanova. And with that being said, AJ and I are signing out. You guys have an awesome day. Go play Battletoads. It's one in my, it's in my top 10 games of the year for 2020. I absolutely love it. My review is on Mikhail and coming soon to youtube.com slash Mikhail Casanova. And I'm just telling you guys play it, play it with your family, play with your friends. It's an amazing fun time i love what you guys at delala studios did with it. it is absolutely fantastic and i'm a long time battle Souls fan so you can trust my opinion <laughs> so <laughs> with that being said we are signing out you guys have a great one hey did you enjoy this episode of the casting of a podcast well i'm sure you did and since you did and you're wondering where else you can find it you can find it on every podcasting outlet. Yes, that includes Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, TuneIn Radio, iHeartRadio, Spotify, Launchpad DM by Podcast One, and so much more. And the only thing I ask of you is if you truly enjoyed it, even if you didn't enjoy it, please leave a rating and tell us what you thought of it, what you like, what you didn't like, and everything in between. And also, if you're looking for video formats of this podcast and many more, you'll be able to find them on YouTube.com slash Mikhail Casanova, as well as on Twitch.tv slash Mikhail Casanova, and new episodes every single Monday morning, 8 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. So, that being said, this is Mikhail Casanova, Hawaii's favorite YouTuber. I am signing out. You guys have a great one.